Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 10 essential choral works for beginners, music for chorus and orchestra. And oh my, these are these are just splendid pieces for you people who really like to have like words attached to their music. Choral music is a, a world unto itself in many respects, but it's one in which so many of us have participated. I mean, just about everybody in the universe grows up singing in choirs. I mean, whether it's as an audience in a church or synagogue or religious nature, or, you know, doing Christmas carols or singing something. I mean, we all sing at one point or another in our lives. Even I did. And although my voice is now in an advanced state of wreckage, um, anyone who watches these videos knows that I still, unfortunately, love to sing and really couldn't care less whether it's tolerable or not. And, you know, there are uh, most music. Let's put it this way. Let me just start with this, folks, especially for you beginners. It will maybe come as a relief to some of you. A lot of people get into classical music because what they're interested in is, is instrumental music. Music without words. That's what I loved. I wanted music without words. I didn't want anyone telling me what it was about. I wanted to figure it out myself. I wanted to bring my own imagination to bear. But the vast majority of music written by all composers, maybe up until really the, the late 20th century, was vocal music. It was songs or music for chorus or sacred music, religious music of one kind or another. I mean, that's what it was. And even instrumental music is written in the image of vocal music. That is, you know, to the extent that it's traditional with, with tunes and melodies and, you know, normal harmonies and whatnot. The fact of the matter is that those instruments are attempt to imitate the human voice, which is the, the greatest of all instruments in terms of what we're used to what we accept, what we expect music to be. And so it fascinates me that choral masterpieces are not better understood or more frequently listened to by people who are not normally classical music people because it's the most natural thing in the world. You may not enjoy the text, you may not be used to the circumstance of the music or what it is, but, but the concept, that is, voices in orchestra is, you know, we know it. We love it. We listen to it all the time. Even people who know nothing about classical music, they'll know Handel's Messiah, for example, which is not on my list. You'll be happy to know. Don't worry. It's on a different list. But, you know, we know these things. We know the Hallelujah Chorus. We know some of these pieces by heart. And they're just part of our, our DNA, part of, you know, the environment, part of Western civilization. You just can't live in this part of the world without knowing something of choral music. And so uh, I don't think that there's any, any issue with someone being a beginner and listening to choral music. I mean, it's just a question of, 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 of isolating that aspect of your musical experience that you already know and know as much as you need to um, and focusing on specific works, which I've chosen to sort of highlight the, the styles of different composers throughout a couple of centuries so that you'll get a sense of, of all the different things that choral music can be in the classical tradition, which is a different sort of thing, of course. And uh, it's just an unbelievably fertile ground for endless quantities of listening. And I mean endless. Oh, there's so much of this stuff. And it's wonderful. So we're going to start with Bach. He from whom all blessings flow, some would have you believe. Now, Bach wrote mostly vocal music. He wrote church cantatas for performance at every, every Sunday in church services, and there's a couple hundred of those. And then he wrote larger choral works, some of which are extremely long and extremely, I think, rather, rather difficult. For example, the St. Matthew Passion, not in terms of how the music is, but difficult in terms of sheer length. Three and a half hours, hmm, three hours. Depending, I mean, it's 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 uh, it could be a struggle, quite frankly. Some people have no problem with it. Some people just plonk it on and go, ah. Oh. I'm not one of those. I don't know if you are either. Um, if you are, go ahead. But I'm not starting with that. My entree into Bach's choral works was the Magnificat. Now, the Magnificat is the prayer that the Virgin Mary supposedly uttered when she was told 
that she was going to give birth to Jesus. And, you know, the, the English words are, you know, magnificat is magnified. My soul doth magnify the Lord. And the whole thing is this prayer. And it's, it's arranged in the form of, of a cantata or something similar than that. A cantata simply means that which is sung. And ordinarily, it's a poetic text that is broken up into choruses and solo arias and, you know, vary in various forms and shapes depending on the text, each of which takes a line or two of the original text, or in this case, prayer, and arranges it in a way which is most musically effective. Now, this particular version does just that. That's what it is. It has a whole bunch of movements, but it's only 25 minutes long, and it does everything that a Bach choral work does in only 25 minutes. It's written for a five-part chorus. It has moments of magnificent ensemble with three brilliant Baroque trumpets and timpani, you know, screaming at the top of their range. It's that, that glorious sound that we associate with Baroque music. It's, it's fantastically brilliant. And then beautiful, beautiful, heartfelt solo arias, which are just songs, interspersed with choruses. And that's all you need to know about it. Take a look at the words, listen to the choruses, listen to the songs, listen to the arias, whatever they're called. You know, you're in business. And in 25 minutes, you can go do something else or listen to it again. So I think that's, that's a great way to get into Baroque choral music. And the other great way is Handel, his Ode for St. Cecilia's Day. Now, Handel, of course, also wrote Messiah, which is two and a half hours long, big, huge choral works. And we're, we're going to do a talk on those two. Don't worry, there's going to be one out there. Um, if there isn't now, if you're watching this in the year 3752, then it's already done. So you don't have to worry about it. But I'm just letting you know as of the date. Um, Handel's Ode for St. Cecilia's Day is not his best known choral work, but it's certainly one of his greatest. It is St. Cecilia was the patron saint of music. And there's nothing better than music about music, let's face it, because it lets the composer just be completely free. You take your, your, your poem, which is all about the beauty of music. I mean, there's a bird aria that's like, you know, twittering along with a soprano, and there's musical instruments mentioned of different kinds, and there's everything about music. I mean, and Handel was really at his best when he was writing music about music. There's another piece of his that's, that's quite similar. It's called Alexander's Feast which we could also be talking about. That's also music about music. And, and uh, these are fantastic works uh, because they, they not only allow the composer to display his genius in all of its naive glory, but they, they really tell us about what the aesthetics of the period are, what the aesthetics of, of the, you know, the, the, the setting, the Baroque ideal was. And so this is a great piece to get you started also with Handel's choral works, which are very different from Bach's, by the way. You know, Handel was, it was much less austere than Bach. Handel was a sensualist. Handel's music is, is yummy and fun and sexy. Bach's is seldom sexy. Bach is more austere. Some would say also more, more transcendental, more spiritual than Handel was. And I think that's probably true. I really do. I think I think Bach was was deeply concerned with with trying to express the spiritual reality behind his text, whereas Handel um, was more interested in having a really good meal. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you hear that. You hear that in these two works. They make a wonderful contrast because the Handel is is full of of hedonistic pleasure, and the Bach, while certainly brilliant and certainly beautiful and certainly pleasurable, nobody would call it hedonistic. Um, and, you know, how do you hear that? What's the difference between two pieces of music? Am I just making it up? That's how it strikes me. See if, see what you think. See, if, see what differences you hear. I mean, that's the joy of doing these things. And like I said, you don't need to know anything. You don't need to know anything. You just need to follow the words and listen. Listen to the way that the composers exploit their instruments. Listen to the way Handel uses color, sheer instrumental color, and treats the voice as, you know, as a mechanism for for beautiful coloristic display, quite different from Bach, and equally marvelous. I wouldn't dare to choose between them, and there's no need to. You just love them both. So now we can move way out of, out of the Baroque period, and this is just a jumble. This is not chronological. This is just works that I really think you're going to love. Number three, William Walton's Belshazzar's Feast, 
oh, this is a hoot. This is a big, well, he calls it an oratorio. Now, an oratorio is a piece on a sacred text for soloists and chorus and orchestra and Handel's, which are the most famous, Messiah being the prime example, um, are big, long, sort of dramatic works that tell a story in, in, in real time, almost like operas, but without staging. And, and so Handel's oratorios run for, you know, two and a half hours or more. Um, Belshazzar's Feast is about 35 minutes, which is great. And there's only one soloist, a baritone. And, and he basically sets the stage and describes a couple things. And it's, it, you know, Walton was influenced by jazz, by, you know, he was a wonderful composer of film music. And boy, will you hear this. I mean, you hear some Star Wars in here. You really do. And the singing is just thrilling. And it's very difficult. It's for an eight-part chorus with extra brass bands coming at you from various directions. It begins with a lament you know, by the waters of Babylon, you know, we sat down and we wept, you know, that biblical thing. Um, and then and then there is the feast when the hand of God comes out and writes, thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting thud. Oh, it's so spooky. It's fantastic music. And then there's a very unseemly celebration when all the Babylonians are killed. And the celebration is extraordinary. So that's, it's a great work. And it's tons and tons of fun. After that, Brahms, a German requiem. Now, I didn't like this piece for the longest time. I really didn't. I owe it to my, my friend and Brahms scholar, Styra Avens, for finally getting me into it. I just found it sappy and kind of annoying. It's a very, very beautiful work. It really is. It's about an hour and 10 minutes long. It's, it's on texts from the Bible. It's not the Catholic setting of the standard Requiem service, that text. We'll get to that momentarily. And it's, it's simply a work of great consolation for people who are mourning. And it has six movements, and there are a couple solos. Again, it's really, it's an oratorio in its way. Um, or a cantata, you know, the lines between the two are kind of blurry. It's Brahms' most famous choral work. It's one of the pillars of choral societies the world over. Everybody sings it, either for full orchestra or, or in an arrangement for pianos or something like that. And it is extremely beautiful. And I, I, I think that it's, it's a piece that, that we need to include because, first of all, you're going to encounter it. And there are many, many people who love it, love it deeply, much more than I do. Uh, but I, my taste is irrelevant. I mean, what matters is your taste. And I include it for that reason. Now that I finally listened to it, and I did a really long video about like dozens of different versions of it, I think I, I, think I actually sang it when I was in high school. So I, I knew it. I always knew it. But now I think I have a deeper appreciation for the, for the, for the beauty of the writing and the depth of feeling that it expresses. And, and so I, I'm, I'm all for it. I really, really uh, like it now. And it's only taken me about 30 years to get there. But there's a lesson there also for all you beginners, which is don't worry about what you like or don't like. And don't worry if someone tells you it's the greatest thing in the world and you just don't like it. That's your right, your solemn right as a listener. And, and the only thing I would caution you to say is don't judge it because you don't like it. In other words, you could say, I don't like it, and I think it's boring, or I hate this part, but don't say it's a terrible piece of music. Don't say that, you know, anyone else who likes it is insane. <laughs> Give it time, because you never know what mood you'll be in, and when you'll be ready for it. When I was ready, it hit me, and I've been fine with it ever since. So there you go. After the Brahms, we have Prokofiev, Alexander Nevsky. Now, this is certainly not sacred music in any, in, by any stretch of the imagination. Alexander Nevsky is a film score for the, for the Eisenstein, Sergei Eisenstein film of the same name, which you can see on YouTube. It's a wonderful film. And the, you know, the helmets of the, the, the Crusaders or one of those groups became the, the helmets of the stormtroopers in Star Wars because, you know, uh, you know the Star Wars guy was a aficionado of, of Russian cinema. So there you go. And Prokofiev wrote the film score. George Lucas, that's the guy, sorry. So uh, Prokofiev wrote this film score, and it was just a great, 
great hunk of movie music for large orchestra and chorus. It's about an attempted invasion of Russia and how Alexander Nevsky fought this huge battle on the frozen lake, frozen ice. There's a great scene, the battle on the ice, one of the classic film is cinematic. They're filmistic, I was going to say, whatever is filmitudinous, cinematic battle scenes. And oh gosh, it's thrilling. It's unbelievably thrilling. Um, the words aren't too relevant. They're like, you know, go Russians and kill the invaders. And the invaders sing in Latin because they're crusaders, actually. So they sing in Latin. They sing, Peregrinus expectavi peres meos in symbolis. I mean, you know, it's easy to remember. It means, as a foreigner, I expected my feet to be shod in symbols. Well, whatever. You know, and then, of course, there's a triumphant victory at the end, which is just incredibly loud and bombastic. There's a lovely alto lament for the dead after the battle on the ice. Um, it's just fabulous music and tremendous fun and, and one of the great 20th century panoramic choral works. So I really am happy to include it here and suggest that you listen to it. People don't know it as well as they should, but people who know Prokofiev love this thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's vintage, vintage stuff, a genuine masterpiece. And it also goes to show just how fertile and, and fantastic the world of film music has become. And just as a source for, you know, sort of suites and other arrangements for concert use, or just in and of itself. There is a recording of the complete film score as Prokofiev originally wrote it, which is far more repetitious. It's very repetitious and quite different. I mean, the the, the concert cantata, um, Alexander Nevsky, is, is vastly better for that purpose than the film score, because when you're watching the music with images, you're not as conscious of the, the repetition and, and the lack of development. But when he arranged it, in several movements for concert pur purposes, he he cut and trimmed and cleaned it up and then made it sh a shapely and beautifully structured work as well as one that's just incredibly colorful and cinematic and fun to listen to. So yeah, Alexander Nevsky. Next, the Verdi Requiem. Now the Verdi Requiem is the real deal in Requiems. You know, the Requiem is the Catholic Mass for the Dead. And it, it is, it is, you know, it's been set by zillions of composers. You know, if you're into them, I did a talk on, on Requiem Masses. You can go look at the videos because there's a whole slew of them there that I discussed. But the classic setting is Verdi's. Um, some might say it's Mozart's, but I discount Mozart's because it, a lot of it's not by Mozart. I mean, Mozart didn't finish it. He left it incomplete. It was completed by others. It's incredibly popular because it's Mozart, first of all, and because it's rather easy to sing um, for like amateur choral societies. But I don't think it's it's I don't think it's it's like the most the most powerful and and interesting setting of the text. God forbid I should say something like that about Mozart, but again, that's my opinion. I think the Verdi is the requiem to start you off on your collection of requiems. I mean, you may ask yourself, why on earth should I collect masses for the dead? What's the point? Well, the point is simply that some of the greatest music ever written has been attached to those words. And the words are beautiful words. I mean, they're prayers. It's, it's, it's you know, grant them rest, O Lord, give them eternal light and peace. And then there's the day of judgment. The part you've heard it before, when you hear it, you'll know the day of judgment, day of wrath, and the, the last trump will sound and the universe will be judged. And oh, my goodness, it just goes on and on. And Verdi was an inveterate dramatist. He's famous for as an opera guy. He wrote Aida and Rigoletto, which is on our list of, of essential operas, 10 essential operas. You know, it, it, it's that style. It is unashamed Italian dramatic theatrical music. And that's what makes it so wonderful because so much in the text is really, really dramatic. You know, it's, it's, it, it, you can set it all very prayerfully and suck all the juice out of it. And sometimes it can be quite beautiful, but, but this is a guy who just went for every single drop of passion and energy and intensity and color. And he made the most glorious orchestral setting. And the solo writing is, is, is just, Gorgeous. Phew. Oh, 
makes me sweat just to think about it. It is long. It's about an hour and 25, 20 minutes long, an hour and a half, somewhere in there. Um, you don't have to do it all at once. It comes in sections. You can take it one section at a time, but you, you got to hear it. You just got to hear it because it is so, so fabulous. And after that, oh, here's one that you probably won't know. Mendelssohn, Die Erste Walpurgisnacht. This is another choral work that I chose because it's not Mendelssohn's most famous one. His most famous one is his Oratorio Elijah, which is a good couple of hours. And it's very famous, and we can talk about that when we talk about oratorios, which, like I said, is it's out there. Don't worry. It's coming, if it hasn't already. Um, but I wanted to choose a choral work by him, which is, again, 25 minutes. That's all. It's as long as a long symphony. And it's fun, and it's beautiful and atmospheric and just terrific. Um, it's in German. Um, a Walpurgisnacht is a pagan ceremony, um, you know, where you celebrate the pagan gods on Midsummer's Night or, you know, one of those solstice type things or equinox or, you know, pick your 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 astrological assignment of alignment of heavenly bodies and you celebrate it then. But in this particular case, this is a poem that was written by the great German poet Goethe about how the the pagans are attempting to celebrate their Walpurgisnacht and the Christians are attempting to kill them and the pagans win. They scare them off by pretending to be, you know, ghosts and goblins and demons and things like that. And they're they're quite gullible and they just sort of run away. But the music is just beautiful and so much fun. And it's a great text, which you can find very easily. And just listen to it. And if you like Mendelssohn, if you've heard things like his third symphony, the Scottish symphony, for example, this is in that same vein. It has some thematic connections to the symphony. It has that... You know, Mendelssohn was fascinated by Scotland and by the mythological Scotland. And a lot of his music is, is, it has a, a certain type of atmosphere, a, a primal, almost mythical quality. You know, the Hebrides Overture, which is one of our overtures in our list of essential overtures, the one that goes da 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 That has that quality too. It's like you've heard it before somewhere, it, it seems. And this piece is like that. And it's, it's a delightful introduction to Mendelssohn, to Mendelssohn's choral works, to his larger choral works, if you feel like, you know, using them as a stepping stone to that. And it's one of his great, great pieces, and no one knows it. I don't know why. It's, it's just fabulous. It'll make a, it's a great concert work, which doesn't get performed nearly as much as it ought to be, but it's been recorded quite frequently. And so it's easy to find and very, very easy to enjoy. So after Mendelssohn, we only have three more. Haydn, the Lord Nelson Mass. Now, this is Haydn, you know, Haydn was a tremendous writer of choral works. He wrote um, Catholic sacred music his entire career. It's one of the great bodies of, of liturgical music in Western civilization. And again, it's not terribly well known. One of the reasons is because Haydn's music is so cheerful and so much fun and so symphonically cogent that People object to its liturgical propriety. They don't feel that it actually works in a service. But these were all written for, for actual church services, although rather splendid ones. They were composed for the name day of the Empress of Austria, at least his last six masses. After Haydn had fundamentally retired, he was pensioned off, and he was still commissioned to write works for special occasions. And he also wrote his last two great oratorios, The Creation and The Seasons, during this period, and his last string quartets and a few things like that, the early 1800s, the late 1700s, early 1800s. Those are the dates. And he wrote six really grand, fantastic settings of the Catholic Mass, which are just the most amazing amalgam of symphonic process with the words of the Mass. Because uh, Haydn was at this point, you know, the acknowledged master of, of symphonic writing, of, of, of sonata form writing, we call it. That is string quartets, symphonies, piano trios, you know, these, these abstract instrumental forms. And he was so good at that and so famous for that that people tend to disregard what he did in writing choral music. But like most composers, as I've said, most of his life was concerned with writing vocal music. He was himself a singer and a very good one. 
Um, and his mistress was a soprano, so there you go. But, you know, he wrote a bunch of operas, he wrote arias, he wrote songs, he wrote everything. And he wrote a beautiful, very extensive series of masses. I mean, I think there's more than a dozen of them all told. And the last six are some of the highest and most powerful expressions of, of sacred music in the classical period. And he's different from this in, in a sense than Mozart, because Mozart, you know, was stuck in Salzburg writing writing sacred music for while he was in Salzburg when he was young, and he hated doing it. And no one thinks he put his best work into that music, although he was Mozart, he was a genius, so there's great stuff, you know, in there. There really is. But his greatest choral works were never completed because he just couldn't sustain the interest. It didn't have a reason to do it. So then you have Mozart's Requiem in the Mass in C minor and their torsos. Um, they're magnificent torsos, that I grant, and and you may want to hear them at some point. But I think that, you know, to start, and I, I just think it's good to hear complete works, works that were actually completed by the person who wrote them, and, and first-rate complete works, as Haydn's late masses are. And the Lord Nelson, Lord Nelson Mass is ferocious. It's, it's scored for simply for organ, strings, and three trumpets and timpani. So it's, it's austere in that sense, but it's incredibly gripping and exciting. And, and it's, it, the first movement, the Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, is one of these, you know, it was, it was named in honor of Lord Nelson, you know, who, who defeated Napoleon um, at one point. And uh, although what Nelson thought of it, you know, we don't really know, uh, but it, it was considered to be an extremely, extremely daring work in its day because it's so, it's so ferocious. It takes the music so into such dramatic places that it, it had never really been done before. Um, and, and so I, I, it's almost a, a study for what happened later in works like the Verdi Requiem because there's drama in this music. And drama is, you know, in terms of a text, which is not terribly dramatic, I mean, the Mass, especially the Credo, when you have these sort of this doctrinaire selection of things that you believe. I believe in the a single baptism and, you know, with the Holy Catholic Apostolic Church and this and that. There's not a lot you can do with that musically, but Haydn does. He really does. And that's what makes the music so extraordinary. Um, it's a thrilling, thrilling piece of music. And if you like it, then there are six more late Haydn Masses. That you can that you can experience, and each one is different, and each one approaches the text differently, and that's what makes it so marvelous. So after Haydn, we're going to go back to the 20th century. Orff, Carmina Burana. We have to do Carmina Burana. You know Carmina Burana. It's played by every band in the world at every at every athletic event that has a band. You know, there's that Do Fortuna, Verlut Luna. Start to variabilis, right? They play just that little bit. They don't play the rest of it. The rest of it you've heard too is the film music for Excalibur. Semper crescis, aut de crescis, vita de testabilis. You know, it's that thing. It's a setting of, of sort of, you know, well, medieval poetry by defrocked monks and wandering scholars and it celebrates drinking and sex and it's very secular and fate and gambling and oh my goodness it's fun and it's Karl Orff's most famous piece and one of the most famous pieces of 20th century music and people either love it or hate it because it, it's very simplistic I mean the setting it's based on very simple tunes little melodic fragments and really really punchy rhythms um, with no symphonic development or anything. It's all just about color and rhythm and melody and what the hell is wrong with that? Not Nothing in my view. It's actually a ballet. It was actually designed to be danced. Um, and I've seen it performed that way and it's really quite wonderful when it's danced that way. But it is, it is a, you know, I, I don't understand why people make fun of these things. I really don't. It, you know, it's what I, my answer to that is always the same. You go do something better. You know, I mean, what's the matter? Are you jealous because it's popular? Because people love it? No, come on. Have a little, have a little, a little, a little, you know, compassion, a little taste, a little class. It's a great piece. 
an absolutely great piece. It's part of a trilogy, by the way. There are two others that uh, Orff wrote after it, which don't really sound like it, and which are not nearly as popular for that reason. He did not merely repeat himself, to his credit, um, but you might also say, or you might argue, that he never wrote anything as good, which is also an argument that you could advance. I don't know. Orff, for our purposes, was a one-shot wonder. And uh, nowadays, you could get a lot more of his 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 music, almost all of which is vocal, most of which is settings of music in Latin and Greek, or occasionally German, and and a lot of it is wonderful. It really is. But Carmina Burana deserves its popularity, and it's it's delightful. So just go have a good time with it. And again, follow the words. It's fun to know what the words are. It really is. But last, last, but not least, here's a piece that you may not know, but it's unquestionably one of the glories of the choral repertoire. It's not performed very often, and I'll tell you why in a second. It's by Holst. Holst wrote The Planets. You know The Planets? The origin of all space music in every film or film score that happened in the 20th century. Holst wrote The Planets around, around 1915, somewhere in there, during the First World War. And he wrote this work shortly afterwards. It's called The Hymn of Jesus. And it's Holst's own translation of a very ancient, you know, text in it was in it was in ancient greek or sanskrit or something i don't know um don't tell me i don't really care but holst made an english translation of this this fascinating text um early early christian text and set it to music to uh, actually the music is quite similar to what you hear in the planets it has that spacey transcendental quality but he also uses gregorian chant you know those ancient church melodies from the the middle ages and and he mixes it all together in this fantastic piece that lasts only 20 minutes long. And the reason that it's so hard to hear in an actual concert performance is because it's only 20 minutes long. It's not easy to sing. It's set for a large chorus and also a separate semi-chorus, as they call it, a half a chorus, a little small group of people that do nothing but sing Amen. And the chorus is in lots of parts. It's divided up all over the place. And so it's a lot of work and it's expensive. <laughs> and the orchestra is really big. You gotta have an organ, you need, you need you know, a piano and a celesta and you need, you know, it's, it's, it's a deal and it's short. And for that reason, you don't hear it. So it's wonderful to hear on recordings where you can hear it. It's so thrilling. It's so beautiful. And it's so fascinating in its handling of the chorus. There are moments when the chorus has to speak, where the chorus whispers in, 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 in sort of random intervals. At glory to the Holy Spirit, they all whisper, glory to the Holy Spirit, glory to the Holy Spirit. Like this. It's, it's, it's really, really cool. There are parts where the chorus hums, there are parts where it breaks up into you know, a zillion, a bazillion parts. It's, it's incredible. It does everything you can do, essentially, with a chorus, but all in, in such a fantastic setting of specific words and within the context of just this magnificently shaped and, and beautifully conceived 20-minute single movement. It's It's thrilling. It's absolutely thrilling. And I, I, you know, I know that, you know, when you do these essential lists, you have to sort of pick all the most popular pieces. But I, I want to pick the best ones. And I want to pick the ones that, that aren't going to tax your attention to the point of, like, distraction. Because choral music can be very, very long and very, very large. And, you know, some of it is. The biggest work here is the Verdi Requiem, which is a big piece. It's a substantial commitment of time. But I really would like you to hear a greater variety of music than to, to focus on just one really long thing. Nothing wrong with the one really long thing, but I like the variety. And the Holst has so much fabulous music and marvelous new sounds packed into 20 gorgeous, gorgeous minutes. I, you know, I might even say start with the Hymn of Jesus. It's that great. It's that marvelous. And I know that you're going to love it. I really love it. There's nothing, nothing in the world like it. Uh, and, uh, you know, some composers just really, really rate, made some wrote, some, wrote some astonishing masterpieces. And this is one of them. And it's just logistics. It's the only reason we don't hear it more often. Because it's too short and too big. 
I mean, it's impractical, but we don't need to care about that. We don't need to care at all, and I sure as hell don't. So those, my friends, are 10 essential choral works that I hope will give you a chance to get into that, that neck of the woods, that branch of the repertoire, one that you've known all your life, but perhaps not quite in this particular format. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me, and take care.